Hello, and welcome to Cover to Credits, the bi-weekly podcast where we discuss books and their movie adaptations. I'm Ian George. And I'm Adina Hilton. In this episode, we'll be discussing Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets was written by J.K. Rowling and was published in the UK in 1998 and in the US in 1999. And the film adaptation, which which was directed by Chris Columbus, came out in 2002. Yeah! Woo! Second Harry Potter. Second one. Uh, thanks, everyone who's listening. We hope you're uh, safe out there, you're healthy, and that uh, just you're you're hanging in there because we know things are a little crazy right now. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot to talk about in this episode. I'm very excited. Me too. So I think we're just going to jump right in. Absolutely. So... Uh, Harry's life is sad. Once again. <laughs> you always have to start him back down. Yeah. I just... Okay, look, this is more a comment about future things, but I cannot believe that, like, no different boarding arrangements could have been made for Harry uh, at the Ian, beginning of these stories. Of course, it ties into later the thing that we're not going to talk about yet, but I do think that uh, okay. maybe that was written in later. <laughs> <laughs> and J.K. Rowling was like, I need a reason to explain why he has to keep going back here. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's probably a later... Uh, but it does, you know, these early books we've talked before, how they have a very whimsical vibe to them. Yes. Uh, very rolled doll in a way. And so I think returning, especially these early books, returning to the evil step parents kind of like puts you back in that the mindset. Aunt and uncle. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Getting us back into that like um, boy who's being like tortured and in some cases literally tortured. Um, it seems <laughs> like he's being starved. Uh, in this book. This time around, yeah. Yeah, so that is fun. <laughs> Man, Harry just ends every book on a high and then immediately goes back into just like the most dismal. I know, we should have like a, a separate like standalone book that's just Harry Potter's Summers. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> An entire non-magical abusive it's just summer. just him like sweeping the floor <laughs> and like raking out the garden and like doing. Dudley just like playing like jokes on him and shit. Yeah, and him like losing losing weight because he's not eating <laughs> <laughs> oh man be great. i want that i want that side story i know <laughs> absolutely uh the the setup for this one because like a lot of the books now have this kind of like one situation going on yeah at the beginning so this one uh um uncle vernon has this business deal yes now it's not quite vague businessman <laughs> which is one of our favorite tropes and yes, stories because he does sell drills he sells drills which is weirdly super specific yeah and i don't know if it makes sense i'm not in the drill business <laughs> <laughs> i don't know who sells them or what kind of drills but this is a big account for him and he is having a couple over to um uh what's the word schmooze, schmooze thank you mm -hmm. he's gonna schmooze them and Harry has to be upstairs and shut up and not say anything. And too bad for Harry, that's when Dobby shows up. Dobby the house elf. Yes. Dobby, honestly, so this movie came out in 2002. Dobby as a CGI character still works pretty well. Yeah, he looks really good, actually. He does. Um, There were only a couple parts where I was like, eh, the lighting's not quite right on his skin. Yeah, or sometimes <laughs> when he's interacting with something or like yeah. the performance of someone looking at him is like a little off. Mm -hmm. But overall, they do a thing too where they did this with um in the first movie with the troll. Yeah. Where a lot of times when they do interact with things, I think they're actually moving those real objects. Yeah. Like when he's hitting his head on the dresser, like they're... It seemed very physical. Yeah, they're actually hitting the dresser in real life and mm -hmm. then adding. So that still gives him a presence. In the scenes, which I think is very effective. It helps, like, you know, reinforce that. Yeah, I agree. And uh, Dobby is there to stop Harry Potter from going back to Hogwarts by any means necessary. Yes. Um, and Dobby is such a interesting figure because he is so annoying. Like, yeah. so annoying. But he's also, like, so pitiful. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you can't help feeling bad for him. And Harry's in the same boat that we are, that he's like, oh, my God, I cannot stand you. But then he's like, oh, I feel bad, though. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just pendulum that kind of just goes back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dobby has hoarded Harry's letters from all of his friends so he wouldn't go back to school and then drops a cake on the ground or in the movie on the guests. Yeah. Uh, so that for some reason, 
his aunt and uncle hate him so much. That they want him to be around all the time? Yeah, so they can torture him. Yeah. <laughs> which is just like, what are you people doing? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. Yeah, so Harry, because of this, gets punished even more than he was already being punished. The bars are on the outside of his window. There's locks on his door. They're like putting food through like a doggy door, apparently. <laughs> yeah, it's like really I know. dark. It's it's upsetting. Uh, luckily for Harry, though, he has friends that care about him. And Ron, George, and Fred are there to rescue him soon. So they show up in their flying car, mm -hmm. uh, rip the bars off the window, and make a daring escape. I enjoyed the fact that the movie included Uncle Vernon falling headfirst out the window. Yes. We talked last episode about um, the actor who plays Vernon mm -hmm. and how great of a comedic actor he is. I oh, think. yeah. Um, but he's so funny in the limited scenes that he has. Like, I just love the detail where he hears Harry leaving and he has to like unlock all the locks uh, <laughs> on Harry's door because there's like at least five locks. <laughs> I know. He's like, he's so good at being so serious, but the joke's always on him. Yeah. And yeah, he just really embraces that. Uh, classical kind of goofy Physical villain. Comedy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, he, sir, I don't think he's, he's definitely not in all the movies. No. Uh, some of them skip the beginning, him being at home. But for every movie he's in, he really brings it. He definitely does. Uh, we don't see a lot of Dudley in this one at all. No, Dudley plays a smaller role uh, mm -hmm. this time around. And we do have a, um, a confirmation. So last episode, we talked about how the mo the movie kind of places Harry's birthday literally right before he goes to Hogwarts. Yeah. And we were curious if that was continued. Because in the book, it's more, not quite the middle of the summer, but not yeah. quite right before. So, and this movie does reconfirm that because as they're escaping with the car, Ron tells him, by the way, happy birthday, Harry. Yeah. And we know that this is like a day or two before they go to school. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense. Yeah, so it all still lines up. So... They're, they're keeping their consistency. Harry's birthday watch. <laughs> Harry's birthday watch. <laughs> <laughs> they take Harry to the burrow, which is the Weasley home, which we are seeing for the first time. There's so many things where I'm reading these books again or I'm watching the movies again, and I have to remind myself that, like, this is the first time that we're seeing this. Yeah. So it's, like, noteworthy. Yeah, these books do such a good job of, like, adding um, scenes or elements that fit organically in the mystery or the story, but are also world building a lot. And I think like the burrow is a good example of that. And Mr. Weasley and the Ministry of Magic. Definitely. And I want to talk about how magical the burrow feels. Yeah, it's so great. In so many ways in both the book and the movie. I think the movie really does a lot to capture that feeling there. Mm -hmm. And I love this scene in the movie, but especially in the book as well. I mean, Harry gets there and it's just this huge ramshackle house that's like not put in any order. He talks about there being like four chimneys like on the top <laughs> of it and everything's like sticking out which way. But it's such a homey, warm and welcoming and happy place. Yeah. And it not only is this the first magical home that Harry is seeing, it's also the first like loving home that he's seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Like the Weasleys are a close knit family. Yeah. I keep having to remind myself how many Weasleys there are. There I are. I keep forgetting how many brothers there are. Yeah. There are seven children. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, but, but I do love just like how expansive the family is and how caring they all are for each other, yeah. especially, especially Mrs. Weasley and how she really takes Harry under her wing. I know. And like cares for him. Uh, it's very sweet. And you love seeing that, especially them just leaving uh, the Dursley's house. Yeah. And you can tell that like Harry does feel at home there mm -hmm. and Ron is embarrassed by it a little bit. Yeah. I loved that too. But Harry's like, it's amazing. Like, why wouldn't I think it's amazing? It's like a million times better than what I have. Yeah. So sure. I think that that, that contrast is really nice that Ron might feel a little ashamed because it might not be like super fancy, but to, to Harry, it's like magic. Well, and something else I like, too, with the set design is so many things like the um, uh, dishes being scrubbed on their own. Yeah. The needles knitting the sweater on their own. So much of it is, like, obviously, like, prop work and yeah. physical. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this, and I'm like, I think this is partly what made 
the appeal of the what is it uh harry potter wizarding world oh yeah in, at, um, universal. at universal because when you look at these older movies like the it, sets are so intricate it looks like you could just walk in there and it's not like a bunch of cgi things no it's not like, it feels like a place it does and i think that's when people like and and uh Diagon Alley is the exact same way. And Hogwarts. And Hogwarts. And they're all like sets that you're like, I feel like I could just walk in there. Yeah. And so when you hear like, holy shit, they're making (laughs) the wizarding world of Harry Potter. Yeah, you want to go. It's like, you know, if they were making like an Avatar world from the movie Avatar, you'd be like, I don't, none of that's real. real. You know, what am I going to be going to? What's that going to look like? Whereas this is like, you can just tell what it's going to be like and what it would be. You know, I agree. That's a good point. And we also are introduced to Arthur Weasley for the first time, (laughs) who is one of my favorite side characters, honestly. He's excellent. I love him so much. He is like, oh, hey, Harry, what's up? And is immediately like, all right, so you live in the muggle world. I need to know (laughs) about muggle stuff. And I just love that he's so, like, passionate about this specific thing. Like, he works in the... um, what is it? The department like, oh, misuse of muggle artifacts. Office. Yeah. Things that are be- bewitched and yeah. like, oftentimes like return to muggle but society. But I love that he like does it himself. <laughs> so it's kind of a joke that like he is using muggle objects like for his own purposes. Um, but he's just so curious and like fascinated by the muggle world. I feel like he has a really like scientific mind where he just wants to know how things yeah. work and like what their functions are. When I was thinking too, it's so funny because like, So many wizards like grew up with muggle parents or grew up in the muggle world until they found out that they were, you know, wizards or witches. And so like so many other people would probably like be better suited for the job. Yeah. They would like know how the post office works or something. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But I think it's just Mr. Weasley's like fascination. It's his passion. It is. That makes him like so much more suited for that job. Yeah. And of course he wants to talk to Harry about like all the muggle things. And there's a part later in the book specifically when he uh, runs into Hermione's parents oh, yeah. and he takes them for a drink. He's oh, like, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, right. the Grangers and I, we're going to go get a drink. Um, we'll meet you all back here later. Yeah. And I just, I like love that detail. Like he was like, he like likes them and wants to hang out with them. <laughs> and there's so many other wizards that like look down on muggles and think like they're not worth anything. So to have someone that's just like so curious about the world, mm-hmm. I love it. Apparently in the movie, there's a shot of Arthur talking to Hermione's parents. And I don't know if you can hear it or or not, but apparently he's saying like, so other muggles are afraid of you, right? Because they're both dentists. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like trying to understand that, which is like so funny. But so they get ready to go back to school yeah. by going to Diagon Alley. Yes. And we get the travel by flu powder in one of the silliest scenes in the movie. <laughs> And Ian and I, like, we've joked about this so much in the past, and it's probably not that funny, but we've made it, like, so funny to ourselves. Like, the whole scene when Harry, you know, does the flu powder and doesn't, like, says Diagon Alley, like, in a stupid way. In the book, it's like, oh, he threw down the powder, it got in his mouth, and he kind of, like, stuttered when he said it. Yeah, but (laughs) in the movie, he's just, like... We were saying it's like a person or like a kid who is in a play and he has like one line. (laughs) He has to walk out and deliver one line and he goes out and he just completely fucks it. (laughs) Yeah, because he like looks straight at the camera and says it like like he's like, he's like, I'm so ready and then butchers it. (laughs) He just doesn't get it. (laughs) <laughs> there have been like so many memes about like him not saying it right that i mean i think other people agree that this is just like a really silly execution but so funny it's really funny he gets to nocturne alley but then hagrid re- rescues him from, from all the wizard crackheads <laughs> it does seem kind of like weird it's super shady <laughs> uh, yeah but then he reunites with uh everyone else which by the way <laughs> In the movie, he runs into the Weasleys back at the bookshop. Yeah. Who were waiting in line for books. Like, they were not looking for Harry <laughs> at all. They were like, oh, Harry, we're oh, good. good. You were wondering. You, you literally were. could have been anywhere in the world. I'm glad you were like, you know. We like, just wanted to buy our books before we went to look for you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. You could have been in Egypt. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but so we end up in the bookstore where uh, Lockhart 
is uh, signing his books mm-hmm. and and what's his first name? I can't. Gilderoy. Gilderoy. Thank you. Gilderoy Lockhart, a very famous, charming wizard, mm-hmm. is uh, you know doing a book signing, and he's very popular. And also a complete fucking idiot. Yes. <laughs> um, we get Malfoy, Lucius Malfoy. Yes. Who shows up. Papa Malfoy. Papa Malfoy. <laughs> <laughs> Not baby Malfoy. No, no. Papa Malfoy. <laughs> um, and I really like the actor that plays him. Oh, I read his name like 50 times. And He's I, been in other stuff. I'm he, sh- yeah. He, he's like very villainous. In general. Mm -hmm. I read that he actually requested having long hair. Ooh. Because he like wanted, he didn't want to look just like a larger version (laughs) of Draco, Draco, (laughs) which he would have with just like the same haircut. So he's like, give me like longer hair. Give me something else. Mm -hmm. And also he said because like of the long hair, he had to hold his head back more. So it didn't go in his face, which he's like gave him like a snooty. Potty. Yeah, looking down his nose at everyone vibe. I love it. Yeah, he was so good. Mm-hmm. But um, we quickly kind of get into this area of him being like, oh, the Weasleys, you shitty. Yeah, poor. Poor, like. <laughs> <laughs> Mug loving. Red haired <laughs> asshole family. <laughs> I know. I'm like, is this like an Irish dig? Like, That's a good question. Is this like an allusion to the british like shitting on irish hmm, people maybe I, I never thought of it that way like possibly being poor or having a lot of children having red hair i'm not yeah. saying that all irish people are like that i'm just saying no like, but it is like a stereotype a stereotype yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. uh i do love though because he's like you know shitting on all the weasleys in his snooty way in the book <laughs> mr weasley and him actually get into oh, this, they like, get into a fight they get into like a fist fight <laughs> Which I really wish we had gotten to see this kind of like pathetic, like older man, like slap fight. Yeah, just like hitting each other on the ground, like maybe like. Eh. Yeah. So uh, I do want to mention like this weird theory that I've heard. Oh yeah, tell me. So in the movie, it's only from the movie. In the movie, we get this weird shot of Draco ripping a page out of a book. Yeah. In the store. Um, and there's like some kind of like fan theory that I read about, and I'm sure there are like a million other fan theories that I haven't read about. So if you've heard fan theories, please send them to us. But the one that I did read about was that Draco rips a page about the basilisk. Oh my God. And that's the page that Hermione has later. As soon as you started talking about, I was like, I think I've heard that too. Yeah. And that's very interesting. And it's, I feel like. I don't know exactly if I like buy into that or not, um, because he does act like he doesn't know anything later on. Yeah. And like when people are being petrified, he's like boasting about it. Oh, he's it. like really happy about yeah, it. Like, yeah. Like he really wanted to like prevent anything. Yeah. Like it'd be one thing to not say anything, but like slip a note. Mm-hmm. It's another thing to be like, <laughs> I'm glad you're all going to die. <laughs> yeah. But it is weird. Like, why is he ripping a page out of a book? Yeah. I don't know if they're just like, because. Malfoy, there's another joke later where he, like, finds this, like, little gift wrapped on a desk. And he's like, is this yours? And then he just, like, pockets it. Yeah. Maybe it's just him taking more things. Maybe. I don't know why he'd want a page from a book, though. Yeah. I don't know. That, that is interesting. I like that theory. Mm-hmm. I like where I like where their head's at. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they leave Diagon Alley and they're getting ready to go to Hogwarts. There is a part that I wanted to read um, from the book because mm-hmm. it's really funny. Um, when they are trying to... Here, I have my book here. They are trying to <laughs> Adina kept reaching back without looking, trying to like find her book. I was trying book. to just grab it and I couldn't. <laughs> so I love this part in the book so much. Just a little paragraph. So this is when they're trying to leave the burrow to get to the train station. Mr. Weasley started up the engine and they trundled out of the yard, Harry turning back for a last look at the house. He barely had time to wonder when he'd see it again when they were back. George had forgotten his box of filibuster fireworks. Five minutes after that, they skidded to a halt in the yard so Fred could run in for his broomstick. They'd almost reached the highway when Ginny shrieked that she'd (laughs) left her diary. By the time she'd clambered back into the car, they were running very late and tempers were running high. (laughs) I know it's like not that extraordinary, but I just like love that image so much. I know. And like, I don't know if J.K. Rowling came from a large family. Yeah. But I think it shows that like she probably knew someone from a large family because that's like. That's exactly what it's like. Yeah, for sure. So I I do love that part. (laughs) There's a lot of well-written humor. Definitely. In the book. And like some of it is brought up again in the movie, but like it just doesn't have that same 
like one of the things I'm thinking of is like the mandrakes. They're talking about them growing yeah. in the book. And at one point, Hagrid's like, yeah, as soon as their acne clears up. Or, <laughs> and that line is in the movie, but it's just kind of like glossed over. You don't yeah. really get it. Uh, it's not as much of a zinger. Yeah, exactly. So like a lot of t- a lot of those lines are so much better written and they're so funny. Yeah. Uh, Harry and Ron run full speed into a solid brick wall. <laughs> yeah. They like crash hard in the movie. It's, it's great. It's well done. <laughs> And also it's the same train conductor from the first movie who sees them. Yeah. He's probably like, it's that same kid who comes every year to play a joke on me. (laughs) Uh, But this leads Harry and Ron to steal the flying car. Yes. Which, I mean, on one hand, it's like, this was a huge leap to do that. But it's another thing. I'm like, yeah, but they're also stupid kids. Yeah. Like, I could also see them doing this. They're like, ooh, let's drive a car. Yeah. (laughs) In the air. (laughs) (laughs) So... Uh, they get, they find the train beneath them. Although I do, in the book, they just find it and they're yeah. flying along with it. In the movie, they turn it into like this whole action sequence. It's this great comedic moment where they realize the train is behind them. Yes. Ron gives this amazing look. <laughs> yeah. Harry is like, do you hear the train? <laughs> I've seen the look Ron gives as like a meme before. Oh my god! Uh, it's it's so funny. But also, Harry almost falls out of the car, and Ron is trying to reach for him. And Harry says, "Your hands all sweaty. Your hands all sweaty." <laughs> <laughs> Which is like such a random line to include, but it's so funny. I love it. I do really appreciate this movie's the way they take certain things from the book. That either weren't action scenes yeah. or they were kind of like short, action, short scenes. action scenes and it really like beefs them up one way or another. Definitely. Uh, this is a great example mm-hmm. where them just finding the train turns into this whole slapstick action fun moment. Yeah. I mean, they're in a flying car. Like, you know, yeah. they like take advantage of it. I do like that the movie does this. Absolutely. And, and it does it in a few other places, too. I'll probably mention, but they <laughs> managed to crash land at Hogwarts. The car kicks them out. Well, I guess they they land in the Whomping Willow first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It beats the shit out of them. Once again, almost all of it was practical. You really? know what I mean? Well, I mean, you can just tell that a lot of the branches hitting oh, them yeah. are like real things, like real made branches. And yeah. it like looks like a ride at a, it does. at a theme park. I'm like, <laughs> I want to be on that ride. If only I could get the shit beat out of me. <laughs> In a Whomping Willow ride. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, And then the car ditches them, which is so funny. I love that the car just leaves and it goes into the Forbidden Forest. It just drives off into the forest. It's like, bye. And there's like no explanation needed. No. It's just like, yeah, no, it just had enough. It was tired. Mm -hmm. Then they finally get into school. They get yelled at, but not expelled. And they have a new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Who is... Gilderoy Lockhart. Played amazingly by Kenneth Branagh. I love Kenneth Branagh. Uh, He's in a lot of, like, British stuff. He's in a lot of Shakespeare movies, which is why I like him. But he plays this role so perfectly. I mean, I'm going to say no one could do better because he is really great. Uh, Lockhart is clearly so full of himself. We get a great part in the movie where we see a painting of him painting himself in a painting. (laughs) (laughs) I just love it. It makes me so happy. (laughs) I also love it's more present in the book, but he just keeps dragging Harry into his like media frenzied mind of like, oh, Harry, I know you want to be famous too. And he's like, oh my God, please stop. (laughs) And it's so funny. It is really great. And this is, goes back to JK Rowling, just writing characters so well. Yeah. She just like gives them one very prominent trait and, but there is depth to it as well. And it's just, she executes that so well, I think. Mm-hmm, definitely. We get that crazy scene where he lets the pixies loose. Mm-hmm. Um, and he never attempts anything of that nature again. No. <laughs> in fact, in the book, one of his quizzes is just all about him. Yeah. It's like, what's my favorite color? <laughs> what did I do in this book I wrote? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then we get a scene. There's a confrontation between the Quidditch teams, Gryffindor and Slytherin, because there are no other houses in these movies, right? No. It's only Gryffindor and Slytherin. Basically. <laughs> we get a little bit of Hufflepuff in this book. Mm. Not a lot. Yeah. 
They get in a fight over who has the pitch. Also, this is where we find out Malfoy is the seeker of the Slytherin team. Mm -hmm. And during this argument, Hermione totally fucking... She owns him. She dunks on Malfoy (laughs) (laughs) so hard in front of everyone. Yeah, she's like, at least we didn't have to buy our way onto the team. And we're all like, oh! Oh! (laughs) That was amazing, honestly. It was great. And oh my God, uh, Emma Watson, when she delivers this line, gives so many head bobs. She's like shaking her hair everywhere. (laughs) Every word is just punctuated by a head jerk. Yeah. Um, But this is where Malfoy uh, really shows his lack of class and calls her a mudblood. Mm -hmm. And this really touches on the prominent theme of this book, I think, which is, um, I don't know what we should call it. It's essentially like... Blood status? Blood status, yeah. Heritage? It's a thinly veiled metaphor for racism. And bigotry. Clearly. Um, we learn a lot about the wizarding world's like classifications here, where we didn't really have any of that in the last book. Yeah. In the last episode, we talked a lot about class and how that was a huge part of that yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, for and sure. And it's definitely still a huge part of this book, too, because we get a lot about the Weasleys and their poverty versus like the Malfoys. But this book really, I think focuses more on that like blood status. I think it's done. I think JK Rowling writes this way so well too, because on one hand, the characters attitudes towards things seem so like, um, obviously flawed. Yeah. Like the, the Malfoys being like, mm, you have to be pure blooded, mm-hmm. but the Weasleys are pure blooded, but they're like, yeah, but you also are poor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I it's mean? It's clear that they just think they're better than everyone. Exactly. And, but it's like still so fucking applicable to real, the real world in terms of like race and class status and how people. And who's allowed to be like part of the, like, Who's okay and who isn't? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just want to say that it's so sad that J.K. Rowling can write on these topics so well in children's books, but her personal views on other topics um, are very flawed and it's frustrating. Yeah. And I think the later books will deal more with other topics. Yeah. But in this one, it's definitely about like that either racism or, um, you know, just being prejudiced in general. Yeah. And, and Dobby too is, uh, another key of that or factor because yeah. Dobby is a creature that's literally enslaved. Yeah. He's literally a slave and, you know, has to be beholden to this family. And it's kind of viewed as like an old kind of outdated thing a bit, yeah. like only the old rich families like the Malfoys have, like enslaved elves, but also mm-hmm. people are like, well, I don't know, what are you going to do? Like write a law, free them, you know, yeah. it's like kind of shows the, um, uh, how the world still kind of stands back and lets things happen. Yeah. And so we figure out like there's this pure blood classification and then there's also this half blood classification where you have like a muggle or muggle born, um, parent, um, who might be a witch or might not be, and then a pure blood other parent, and then there's also the mud blood classification or muggle born classification where you're a witch or wizard born into a muggle family like Hermione. And then we also find out about squibs, which yeah. are non magical folks born into pure blood families. And to me, this was a direct corollary to inbreeding. Mm. And how, like, if you inbreed too much, you get birth defects. Interesting. And how, like, I think J.K. Rowling is showing that, like, it's actually bad to only interbreed with pure bloods. Huh. That you need, like, the muggle blood to infuse the magical, like, lineage, basically. It's funny you say that because uh, we're not quite there yet, but when talking later about, like, the um, the heir of Slytherin, you know, Slytherin was a guy, uh, Salazar Slytherin was like, oh, yeah. only pure blood, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, well, shouldn't the heir of Slytherin be like some inbred idiot? <laughs> like, yeah. Wouldn't even like, you know, wouldn't that be the lineage and mm-hmm. like the direction that that would go naturally? So maybe, J- yeah, maybe J.K. Rowling is addressing that with squibs. I, I had never so. really thought of that. Mm-hmm. So maybe <laughs> I was going to say maybe Filch is the heir of Slytherin. <laughs> 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 with no magical ability. No. Also, I couldn't help but wonder, is it mean to make Filch, like, the caretaker of the I castle? I know. I felt bad. Because, like, wizards can literally just, like, enchant a broom and sweep something up. But they're like, well, maybe we should, like, hire this man 
who can't do anything. Who's like essentially handicapped in the wizarding world. Yeah. And have him do things that we could do with like the flick of a wrist. Mm -hmm. Because like, you know, it'll be like a job opportunity. Yeah. Or maybe it was like he needed a job. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. It just all seems like. (laughs) I know. It is weird. I almost feel like that should have been like looked into more. Maybe they do in other books and I don't remember. Yeah. But just like, are there not job opportunities for squibs in the wizarding world? Yeah. Where Where is that line? I have a lot of questions about jobs in the wizarding world, but we'll probably get to that <laughs> in later books. <laughs> that's very valid. I, I yeah. <laughs> uh, I want this to lead into a great discussion about how Ron is the standout performance in this second movie. Um, Ron is so angry at Malfoy for calling Hermione a mudblood that he takes out his broken ass wand and tries to curse Malfoy. And of course it backfires on him. Yeah. And (laughs) he ends up uh, throwing up slugs. And I just want to say this may be the funniest thing in all the Harry Potter movies. The visuals of it. Uh, Rupert Grint's performance of yes. when he's throwing them up. And his face, like the makeup is so good or however they make his face look so nauseous and sick. My God. W- later when they're at Hagrid's hut. Yeah. The visual, even when he wasn't throwing up slugs. He just, just looks like he's about to. <laughs> Ron clutching the bucket to him and just being pale as a ghost had me cracking up so much throughout like Ian was like losing his shit watching this movie it was it's great. just I like the <laughs> it's like the perfect visual gag almost is yeah. him just continuously throwing up these gross slugs yeah it's so great but like I think we said in the last episode that Malfoy was kind of the standout performance of the first movie he was out of all the kid actors mm-hmm. he really uh just kind of stood out as being so confident yeah and like delivered his lines and the jokes so he was well so expressive and he that's still true oh yeah uh but like i think ron really came to his own in this one yeah um between like that this scene with the slugs that whole like car scene at the train is yes. so good and then later with the spiders like ron is just like having a moment here <laughs> we need to recognize it we do like his scrunched up <laughs> expressions his yeah. like squeaks his squeaking voice when he's like nervous mm-hmm. uh yeah i think and i i think it's a problem because like he's so good as a kid that when he got older for other movies he couldn't be a silly. Yeah. And they didn't really know quite what to do with him almost. It's mm-hmm. so like this right now was like peak. This is peak Ron. Where he fit in perfectly. He got to be like this like scared, goofy, comic relief kid. Yeah. And I think um, Chris Columbus, the director, just uses him beautifully. I agree. This is great. <laughs> There's also another moment I just wanted to bring up in the Hagrid hut scene. And I like it. In the movie, Hagrid is the one who explains yeah. uh, the difference between pure bloods and mud bloods and everything. And he's so sweet and kind towards Hermione. I know. And just telling her that she's so great. He's like, don't you think on it, Hermione. <sighs> I know. It's so wonderful. And it, it makes us love Hagrid even more. Oh, Hagrid's the best. Hagrid is the best. Hashtag Hagrid is the best. <laughs> but I do like that in the book... It's Ron that kind of delivers this information while throwing up slugs. (laughs) But I appreciate it because, like, Ron seems very passionate about this point. Yeah. And it's very sweet because, like, you can tell he does care about Hermione, even though they're sometimes antagonistic towards each other. Yeah. But, like, you can see how, like, he got that from his parents. Mm -hmm. That, like, you know, caring about muggles and muggle-borns and, like, not seeing those. Yeah, not discriminatory. Yeah, Yeah. and that he was, like, just as offended as anyone about what Malfoy said. And so I did like that, too, in the in the book that we got that from Ron's point of view. I agree. I think it added a level of depth to his character, seeing him be passionate about something like that. Yeah. So I really liked that. Mm Mm-hmm. What are ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> what are ghosts? Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> what are ghosts in this world? I don't know. It's not clear to us. We get a bit in the book where Harry, Hermione, and Ron go to nearly headless Nick's uh, 500th Death Day celebration where there are tons of ghosts. It's a whole, like, the jokes about him not being able to join the headless hunt are really great. They're so funny. Um, But honestly, the question that I have is like, what is like the afterlife slash ghost life like mm-hmm. in Hogwarts? We don't, I don't know if we ever get an explanation. Like some people are ghosts. Some people are like in portraits. 
Like some yeah. people don't come back clearly like Harry's par- parents. Like what? Yeah. Like, is it the tragedy of how they died? Because Harry's parents should have been. Oh, they should have been haunting the shit out of Voldemort. <laughs> like. <laughs> also, we were joking about like, are portraits like sentient and have like, like emotions? Like yeah. if you burned a portrait. Like, would they die? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> would they like melt and be screaming? And it would be like, would it be like awful? And we have some other examples of like interesting ghosts, like the professor of like the history of magic. <laughs> I love this character because he's apparently like this really old man who just like died in the uh, professor's lounge one day. But like his ghost got up and just kept teaching class. Yeah. And like people don't think he knows that he's dead. <laughs> or like doesn't care. Yeah. And then we have like Moaning Myrtle as well. And later on, she says something specifically about how she came back to like haunt someone. So I don't know. I don't think we have answers here. I just want to put it out there. I I agree. And I'm not sure J.K. Rowling has answers either. This is one of those things that like fits really nicely in these like early books. Yeah. Where like I don't need explanations for things. Uh, There is a line where Dumbledore talks about for one of the parties, he wants to hire a dancing troupe of skeletons. (laughs) It's just like this throwaway kind of funny line. But you're like, what does this mean about the world? What are sentient skeletons? Like, if you're hiring them, do they, like, engage in commerce? Do they have, like, a bank account? Are they people? Yeah. Like, will you see a skeleton, like, in Diagon Alley? What is the... What are the rules here? What is going on? Yeah. Like, there's so many things like that. And I mean... I think I'm still in my head is in the movies because the movies get more serious. Yeah. Like the movies mostly lose the ghosts later on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe the books remain as silly and I just like don't quite remember. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure. So I'll be curious where the silly meter is (laughs) as these these books go on. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But that is our discussion on. What are ghosts? Yeah, tell us if you know. If you know, I, I if you know, know what a ghost is, <laughs> please let us know. Let's get to the meat of the story. The first big not murder yes. that happens. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Mm-hmm. Enemies of the air beware. Mrs. Norris has been petrified. <laughs> and a message has been written on in blood in the movie. Yeah. And in the movie, we never find out where did this blood come from? We don't know. Whose blood is this? <laughs> <laughs> Not clear. Although actually I do think I know because in the book there's a subplot about roosters being killed. Oh yeah. Because they're deathly they're they're deadly to the basilisk. Uh-huh. And I think it was rooster blood. Okay. That makes sense. Which which makes sense, but because that subplot was dropped in the movie. Yeah. Like, the blood mystery (laughs) remains. You're like, what? I don't understand. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Mrs. Norris, the cat, is found. Mm -hmm. Which, (laughs) not to get on too many side tangents, but when I was a kid, it really confused me, I think, (laughs) the role of the cat, Mrs. Norris. Yeah. Because people in this world can just turn into animals. (laughs) And the fact that this cat is called Mrs. Norris, (laughs) I think as a kid, I always thought it was, like, a person. Oh, my God. But I never quite understood. <laughs> You're like, is this Filch's wife? Yeah. I'm like, did someone hang Filch's wife from like a, yeah. a, a lamppost? I wasn't entirely clear on when I understood who Mrs. Norris was. So, you know, people are getting petrified or at least cats are. But who cares? We have to have our Quidditch match, right? Yeah. It's off to Quidditch. Yes. We can worry about mysterious messages on walls later. We only get one Quidditch match in this book and movie. Yeah, I mean, we only get one last movie, too, though, I right? I thought there were multiple. Hmm, I can't quite remember. I feel multiple. like there's one in every movie that there is Quidditch, yeah, for the most there's part. There's at least one. Um, I have some questions about this. I know we talked about Quidditch last time, but I have further questions. Questions persist about Quidditch. Because, so this is the whole time where Harry is trying to catch the snitch and the bludger is, like, after him. Mm-hmm. And in the movie... Hagrid is clearly like, oh, that's a rogue bludger. Like, someone needs to, like, stop that. But in the book, this bludger is just, like, chasing him and trying to, like, murder him the entire game. And at one point, they, like, stop for a timeout. And Harry's like, I don't know what to do. Like, it keeps trying to kill me. And everyone's like, well, oh, well. (laughs) And, like, the, you know, Quidditch person... The referee, I guess. Madam Hooch. Madam Hooch is like, oh, are you ready to like start playing? And I'm like, is no one who is refing this game? Yeah. Like who is refing this game? Who is handing out the yellow cards, the red cards, <laughs> the flags, anything? Like, yeah. I don't understand. It, absolutely. Because like 
in the first movie, Harry's broom gets bewitched. Yeah, and, and he, no like, one gives a shit. No, like some people in the audience are like, "I'll try to help." Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, there's no um accountability. Madam Hooch is not doing her job. No, there need to be at least like three or four refs flying around to like give people penalties. You know what I mean? And there also needs to be someone that can like enchant the field so that certain activities are not allowed to happen. Like yeah. murder. Like <laughs> <laughs> murder should never be allowed to happen. Like Harry gets his arm broken and they just keep playing. Yeah. Like oh, as oh. soon as someone gets an injury of that kind, it should trigger some kind of alarm. And play stops so they can get the person out and then get like the alternate which everyone should have an alternate as well (laughs) true they don't have alternates they don't have i'm just saying ian this is very upsetting for me (laughs) i'm like who is in charge i think it's just it it makes it so obvious considering the last movie or book there was a crazy wild thing involving harry on the quidditch pitch and here we are again like all of harry's villains and enemies should just know like I mean, Quidditch is fair game. Yeah, I can, you can do, do what, anything. Whatever I want to Harry during Quidditch, which now that I think about it, happens in the next book too. I'm go- <laughs> <laughs> Who is in charge? Maybe this is just the game of Quidditch. Maybe it's like in the rules that it's like, hey, you can do anything you want during these games. No one's going to stop Survival you. Survival of the fittest? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I anyway, do, that's the end of my rant. I do like in this Quidditch match, though, they had to be a little more inventive since the first one was just pure Quidditch. Yeah. This one, we kind of get this like Star Wars. Um, Going through the trenches yeah, the, in the, the bleachers. Yeah, the trench run yeah. Uh, with Malfoy and Harry with the rogue bludger following them. It was good. I liked it. It was. It was all very well done. It was very exciting. Uh, Harry's arm gets broken as he catches the snitch. Once again, Harry only knows how to catch a snitch if it's like this diving Hail Mary like, yeah. last ditch effort. Uh, but he catches it and wins it for everyone. Unfortunately, Lockhart arrives first at the scene of his injury and ends up deboning his arm. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of gross like body horror humor yeah. in this movie, but I'm like really here for it. I think it like all works really well. They, there's this really like tiny great part in the movie where they're in the infirmary and Draco is like moaning on the bed <laughs> and Madame Pomfrey, the head nurse is like, oh, get out of here, Draco. Like, you're fine. And he's like, uh. <laughs> I do. Cause he would be the type. I know. To like, as soon as he's actually injured would just like be this like big baby, baby about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. We do get Dobby coming back here, though, and being like, oh, yeah, I did that because I was just trying to help you. I wanted to, like, maim you, not, like, kill you. <laughs> yeah, we some of the answers are mis- some of the, We do get some answers to mysteries in the story. More mysteries persist, though. Yeah. And especially when Colin. Creevy. Creevy uh, becomes the first human victim mm-hmm. to be petrified by the snake. Yeah. Or, I mean, um, whatever's happening. The <laughs> unknown monster. The unknown mystery monster that is happening I was here. telling Ian, it's really great that you all know the plot to the Harry Potter books, so we don't have to explain it, because it is a very, like, in-depth mystery book. Yeah. And we talked about this in the last episode, how the first one was also a mystery. Like, they're trying to figure out, you know, what the Sorcerer's Stone is, and in this one, they're trying to figure out the Chamber of Secrets. And it's kind of cool in this one that the adults, like, the professors also don't really know yeah i really do i think this one works so first of all like i think the first story has to focus so much on uh like creating the world establishing establishing characters it's also the shortest book so like the mystery is like much smaller kind of it's kind of there this is like hardcore murder mystery oh yeah there's a lot of clues there's a lot of red herrings yeah there's a lot of um random things kind of brought up and little tiny details that end up being important later so it is cool to like read through it and to notice all those little details yeah this one feels like much more um steeped in like this mystery of what's happening why is harry hearing voices Mm -hmm. um what are the spiders? What's the chamber of secrets? What what are all these things? Yeah. And I think it's pretty effective in that way. Um, going along with the theme of who is in charge, <laughs> we have the dueling club. Yes. Which meets only one time and then is disbanded forever. <laughs> <laughs> Not due to lack of turnout, but more lack of... Um, supervision. Supervision and enforcement. Yeah. Uh, Adina, I have to say that this scene is a momentous occasion in the Harry Potter movies. Really? Momentous. Huge. Because 
it is literally, as far as I have picked up on, the first time since the beginning of this series that Harry casts a spell with his wand. Oh, yeah, because we talked about that in the last episode, how Harry doesn't cast a single spell in in the the entire entire movie. movie. Not in the books, in the movie. He doesn't cast a single spell. (laughs) And as far as I could tell, up until this point... In the movie, oh my God. he has still not cast a single spell. <laughs> wow. And it's only in this moment when he's facing off against uh, Draco that mm-hmm. he finally casts a spell. Yeah. He finally succeeds Adina. Wow. That is momentous. It only took an entire movie and, and a, a half. half. <laughs> like, I don't know, two and a half hours a piece and like four hours. <laughs> One and a half years of wizarding school. <laughs> While everyone else is casting spells around him, Harry finally Harry's like, does I'm it. good, honestly. <laughs> I don't need it. I have my broom. Well, and Harry doesn't really do any other spell besides this one, so. <laughs> he casts, there's one other I can account for okay. when he levitates the cupcakes. Oh, yeah. Uh, because Ron's wand is broken, so he does that. Because I wrote down, I was like, he did it again. I was like so happy for him. I was just talking about how like he notoriously only does Expelliarmus like that's true the whole series <laughs> oh yeah yeah he doesn't need he doesn't need a lot he's like I got this I'm good it's like just having a taser you yeah. know what I mean yeah like you don't really need any other weapons as long as you're quick on the taser exactly <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah this is supposed to be a learning exercise for all the students at Hogwarts and it just immediately devolves into chaos we do find out though about Harry's parcel tongue abilities which yeah. explains the earlier episode in the first book where he talks to the snake. Yeah. So, Harry can talk to snakes. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> it's always the same thing, Adina. Yeah. It's always like the same phrase repeated. Yeah. Snakes only know how to say, like, I'm a snake. <laughs> <laughs> I am a snake. The, like, the, the snake's like, I'm a snake. And Harry's like, I'm a snake. And the, <laughs> the snake's like, snake? <laughs> and then it goes away. That's all they're saying. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so now everyone thinks that Harry, Harry is the heir of Slytherin. Yes. This is the first instance in, I feel like, what happens in many books where everyone's, like, suspicious of Harry. Yeah. And it's very annoying because I feel like every book, Harry proves himself. And then every book, the students are still like, hmm, I don't know about that Harry, though. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, though, Harry doesn't have a single year that goes by when he's not, like... Involved in weird Involved shit. in something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So people are like, I just... I don't know if he's, like, good or bad this time. There's just he's, something weird about him. Yeah, he's definitely in on something. <laughs> we get another attack now with Justin and also nearly headless Nick, which begs the question of how they're expecting to revive the ghosts. I don't know. No, they never they explain, explain how it. they revive nearly headless Nick. Yeah. Because, like, there is a joke in the, the feast scene or his death day party where the ghosts pass through food yeah. to, like, kind of eat it, and they're like... So maybe they just w- waft a mandrake w- through him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just kind of, like, pass it through him multiple times. I don't know. Yeah. Harry does go to Dumbledore's office because he's found at the scene of the crime again. <laughs> <laughs> and what is he found doing, Adina? In the movie, at least, he likes to touch the hands of the petrified <laughs> <laughs> victims. He's just like, I just want to know the touch of another person. <laughs> the touch of like a corpse. <laughs> anyway, moving on. He goes to Dumbledore's office and Dumbledore gives him the chance to explain, which Harry does not take, which I feel like is foreshadowing for later books when Harry just decides not to ask anyone for help ever. He's no, fine. He's got to do it on his own. But we do get a really great scene in both the book and the movie where Hagrid comes to defend Harry and is like, it wasn't him. I swear it on my life. I promise. Like, I know I was with him and like this thing. So I know Hagrid is like always there for Harry. Yeah. He's like so supportive of Harry. It would be like really shitty if like Harry like randomly suspected that, yeah, I don't know, maybe Hagrid is like a murderer and he just believes it. Yeah, uh, exactly. That would suck if if Harry just like doubted Hagrid for even a moment. And we're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but first we have to talk about the Polyjuice Potion. Yeah, and this is Hermione at her most like chaotic, I feel like. <laughs> it is. Because she's just like, Yes, um, we're going to make a potion. Um, And yes, I'm going to have to steal ingredients from Snape's cupboard. (laughs) And yes, you're going to have to knock out your uh, culprits and then steal some of their hair to put into the the potion. (laughs) She got a taste of the anarchy life last year. And she's like, I want more. 
She's going hard. She's like, I need more chaos. <laughs> she's like a loose cannon cop on the edge. Exactly. She's got to solve the mystery no matter what. Exactly. Uh, yeah, this is kind of like, she's like, it's our only idea. And, and I'm like, mm, I think you could all come up with better ideas, <laughs> honestly. Uh, but they brew the polyjuice potion in the bathroom, the abandoned bathroom where Moaning Myrtle yeah. haunts. And they, <laughs> so in the movie, well, I should say in the book, they, Harry and Ron, um, knock out Crab and Goyle. Yeah. They give them a... Drugged. An enchanted <laughs> cupcake. It's mad. It's got a potion in they it. They got roofie. It's not roofie, Zadina, because <laughs> it's magic. And in the movie, they're required to put them in a broom closet and take their clothes. Yeah. I'm like, this is really... Weird. Yeah. <laughs> Date rapey, like crossing a line. Definitely. They're, but they suck though. So like we can do this to them. Unfortunately, it goes very wrong for Hermione and she turns into a cat. Yes. But Harry and Ron are able to transform into Crab and Goyle. And honestly, like the movie scene with this is so funny. It's so well done. Mostly just because of uh draco yeah but also i think it's it's cool to see crab and goyle like these actors actually try to portray i was else. gonna say their performance i think is like really solid like yeah. them pretending to be harry poorly pretending to be crab yeah or goyle i forget who's who mm-hmm. and and draco just being draco is also excellent the best line in the whole movie Ian. yes is when the whoever harry is playing says something like, oh, why are you wearing glasses? And he's like, oh, I was just like reading. And Drake was like, I didn't know you could read. <laughs> <laughs> and just like a, hmm. hmm. <laughs> so I read this, Adina, and I don't know if I can believe it or not. Yeah. They claim that Tom Felton improvised that line. That he had. For- I believe it. That he forgot his. I don't know if I believe it only because like the setup of. Why are you wearing glasses? I yeah. don't know where else that could have gone. And that's yeah, like such that's a perfect true. execution. But I also do believe Tom Felton is like talented enough to have come up with something like that. Yeah. I kind of want to believe that he. I want to believe it too. Because it's <laughs> such a weird line. And you're like, do wizards not know how to read? Like. <laughs> and that like, not only are you dumb, but he's like been getting through school this entire time reading. Yeah. Or without reading. Yeah. It's it's so funny. <laughs> Uh, but they do find out through talking to Malfoy that he is not the heir of Slytherin, as mm-hmm. they suspected. But he does imply that his father knows about it. Yeah. Around this time, Harry discovers a uh, blank diary that was discarded through very odd <laughs> means and is like, yeah, OK. This seems normal. I should <laughs> trust it. <laughs> uh for some reason in the movie, Harry just decides to, like, write in it. He's like, I am Harry Potter. <laughs> in the book, there's a little more of an explanation why he thinks it might be, like, magical or something. Yeah, which I, I enjoyed in the, the book. I thought that was well written. In the movie, he's just like, yeah, well, let's just give this a shot. <laughs> yeah. We get this flashback scene where the diary tells him about what happened when the Chamber of Secrets was open 50 years ago. So, you know, Tom Riddle is there. He shows us that Hagrid may be responsible. Yes. uh, And that we we also see in the movie, young Dumbledore. Is he though? (laughs) Is he really 50 years younger? He does not look 50 years younger. I don't think so. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But there was a great little moment that I only picked up for the first time. I feel like most of the times we watch these movies, they're on like um, free form. Yeah. Uh, formerly known as uh, ABC, ABC Family. Family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so sometimes I don't actually pick up a lot of the nuances because they're more in the background. But I did like the moment where uh, Tom Riddle is talking to Dumbledore. Dumbledore asks, is there something he wanted to tell him? And he says, yeah. no, sir, or what, whatever it is. And it perfectly reflects when Harry decides not to tell Dumbledore something yeah. beforehand. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like really subtly done. Well, and it's a reference in the book, too. Oh, is it? Yeah, because Harry remarks that, like, the way he says no is the way that he himself said no. Like, he recognizes it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He mm-hmm. makes that same connection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like that where, like, you don't have to see that specifically to, like, understand no. anything. But, like, it's a nice little moment where when you do pick up on it, it feels rewarding. It does. Yeah. So 
He so, sees this, <laughs> and now thinks Hagrid is like a murderer. I know. Like we were just mentioning, why would he ever think that Her- that Hagrid would do something like this? I think the explanation in the book makes sense. Yeah. They're like, if Hagrid thought there was a creature in there, he may have opened it in the first place. Yeah. Although how he would be the heir of Slytherin, I don't yeah. know how they thought that. Yeah. But they were like, I don't think he opened it this time. But maybe he knows who did. Mm-hmm. So it's like a little bit more like, oh, we believe in the movies. Just like it's Hagrid. I think Hagrid killed someone. <laughs> <laughs> and also around this time, Hermione is petrified. Yes, Hermione um, is discovered with a hand mirror petrified in the hallways. Mm-hmm. And this is a kind of a, a small gripe I have with the story in that the book and movie seem overly reassuring immediately ever since the uh, Miss, Mrs. Norris was petrified. Yeah. That these people will be brought back. Yeah. With the Mandrix. With the Mandrix. It's like we have Mandrix. We just have to wait until they're mature. Mm-hmm. Um, but so it just kind of like takes some of the stakes away. Like yeah. all these be- people are being petrified, which is like, yeah, terrifying. And we do know that someone died the last time the chamber was open. But in terms of like... Well, we don't find out until way later that you could actually die from this monster. Exactly. And not just get petrified. It seems like at this point, like, the, the worst thing that can happen is you're petrified. Yeah. In which case, it's like, well, I'm just going to miss an entire year of school. Which, by the way, <laughs> did Colin get held back in school? And the exams were canceled, Ian, so no one got <laughs> held back. <laughs> Nothing in this school matters. Yeah. But, like, Colin missed, like, the whole year almost. Yeah. He got petrified, like... Way at the beginning. Yeah, before Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe someone, like, read him the notes from class every day. I, I don't know. <laughs> My gripe with this is that I'm really annoyed that this takes Hermione out of commission for the rest of the story. Yeah. So, this is interesting, too, because, like, I think if I... I don't know. I don't remember feeling this way when I was a kid, but I was how I was a kid and like, what the fuck did I know? Yeah. But um, this book is definitely like Harry and Ron yeah. in the final act. Mm-hmm. And I I know that the next book and movie are Harry and Hermione yeah. in the final. So like for me, like they each get. I guess so. I, I was just annoyed because Hermione is clearly the most valuable member of the team. Yeah. Like, she certainly brings honest. the most <laughs> to the table. And they're like, oh, too bad. Hermione's out of commission. And then she ends up helping them anyway and like solving it for them anyway. And so I'm like, the least you could do is have her get some fucking credit and be there for it. Yeah. I, I mean, they do are like, we couldn't have done it without you, like, quite yeah. literally. Like, they do give her credit, I'd say. But I agree. Like, it is sad to see her, like, out of commission in this final, yeah. like, confrontation. But for me, it's at least, like, made up for in the next story yeah. when Hermione, like, plays a much more active role in the finale. And, That's true. And uh, Ron is, like, taking a back seat. Mm-hmm. But I could imagine if I was reading this for the first time, I would probably be like, what the hell? Like, come on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so Hermione gets, um, gets, uh, petrified petrified. (laughs) and then they're like, oh, we should confront Hagrid. And that's when this whole scene happens. Um, when Hagrid is taken to Azkaban, Dumbledore is suspended as headmaster. It's all kinds of chaos. I think in terms of world building, this scene hurts a little bit really well it's weird because this is our first introduction to cornelius fudge right the yes. uh, minister of magic. minister of magic and like he's like the fucking president of like wizards in the uk right yeah like he's like the most prominent figure politically mm-hmm. and so for his introduction to be showing up at hagrid's hut to arrest to him. arrest him and be like uh you'd think they'd find someone like <laughs> you know uh more suitable for this they wouldn't yeah. just send fucking wizard the president. the president of wizards here to like you know take a groundskeeper to prison that's true so it feels like weirdly like 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 making his role feel a lot less significant. I agree. That's a good point. It's kind of weird in that way to introduce him. Mm -hmm. Like, I think he should have been in like, I, and I don't know, maybe I'm like, there isn't anyone above him, right? No. Okay. I didn't think so. (laughs) So yeah, the the introducing him in this way feels like very strange. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I'm glad you agree. It is weird. 
Uh, also, <laughs> I do love, it's, it's funny that like both Dumbledore and Hagrid as they're walking out of the hut. Yeah. Like no Harry's there. So and they're like talking to the air. They give like vague um, <laughs> If warnings. anyone wants to find out some stuff. <laughs> and Cornelius Fudge is like, is there like a gas leak in here? Like what the fuck is everyone doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this leads Harry and Ron to follow the spiders. They're on a quest into the Forbidden Forest. And let me just say that this trek into the Forbidden Forest makes so much more sense than last book's uh, trek into the Forbidden Forest when they were on detention. He, oh my God, I know. <laughs> I listened to our old episode and was reminded of how absurd <laughs> that entire thing is. But this makes more sense. They're trying to find answers. They're going rogue. Hagrid's gone they don't have anyone to protect dumbledore's gone yeah so they're yeah. really kind of going rogue they have no one else to really help them um of course this is like a very terrifying scene in the movie and i still found it very frightening as someone who does not like spiders it was oh it it's was so gross fruit. oh my god i read that rupert grin actually does genuinely have arachnophobia Ugh. and he has like not been able to like watch this scene oh my god the the part where the spider is actually like latched onto him in the car. Oh, yeah. I read he like wasn't acting at all in oh that God, scene. Like he was so genuinely like terrifying. <laughs> we find out info from Aragog, which is cool. Um, and I love that in the book, there's this detail about how Haggard actually finds Aragog a wife. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, I don't want Aragog to be lonely. I'll get him a spider wife. And then they can fuck and have like a shit ton of like huge spiders. They can just infest the woods yeah. with like dog sized spiders. And they spiders. clearly eat people. This is fine. Yeah. <laughs> this is like Hagrid, like <laughs> kind of being dumb and not thinking. Like Hagrid, like basically yeah. sends Harry and Ron to their deaths. I know. <laughs> but I do like in the book that Ron says, like, that's Hagrid's ultimate flaw yeah. is that he, um, doesn't see monsters as being monsters or even being dangerous exactly that he like sees the best in them and it's yeah. like his greatest um weakness attribute and weakness mm -hmm. is like this like kind of um trustingness that he has yeah so i did like that line it kind of did you're like you know what that's true that is like just a flaw of haggard in general yeah you're like haggard is not being the best in this moment but i still want to believe the best of him i still appreciate it yes i also want to say that like this is another moment where the movie kind of improves on the book slightly mm -hmm. for some reason in the book i don't understand why they come across the car first, first. Yeah. And then get taken by the spiders and then the car comes to save them. Yeah. When it's much more impactful in the movie. For the when, car to just show up. Yeah. Like you had forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't, you know, on your mind at all. And then suddenly it just shows up to save them. And, and it's it was like so cool. the car. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it's a great chase scene with the spiders in the car. Once again, the movie heightening one of those scenes really well. Ugh. Also, can I just say I want a side book. Uh, what was the car doing all year? I know. Is the car living its best life in the forest? Does it have a car wife? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, what's it doing? Is it friends with the centaurs? Yeah. Like, I really just want this car. Also, I'm curious because I don't remember. I weirdly don't remember a lot about later books. Yeah. Even though I, like, technically read them more recently. But, like, I'm like, did the, does the car come back? I can't remember. I kind of really hope it does. I don't remember it coming back, but I could be wrong. Because I think that'd be so cool in, like, book six, they're in the woods or something, and suddenly the car returns, and it's even more shitty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the car drops them off back at school, and then just drives back into the woods, which is just excellent. It's perfect. Uh, so now they know Hagrid is innocent. Mm -hmm. He did not open the Chamber of Secrets. He just loves him. Some spiders. Yes. And this is where we get a clue from Hermione, who is, even though she's out of commission, she's still driving the plot of a story because she knows more than everyone, where they find the piece of paper mm -hmm. that she has about the basilisk. Because Harry just keeps touching the hands <laughs> of petrified people. Yeah. <laughs> He's just like, let me touch your hand. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they find out it's a basilisk, and it's going through the pipes. And Harry also realizes that the girl who died last year in a bathroom is moaning Myrtle. Mm-hmm. And also around this time, Ginny Weasley is kidnapped, uh, is kidnapped by the uh, whoever has opened the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah. So now we're gearing up for the final act. Mm -hmm. Harry and Ron ignoring any common, any like 
logic of telling a teacher who isn't Lockhart. Yeah. Uh, They're like, let's get Lockhart to help us. Yeah, sure. Why not? Like, he's <laughs> as good as any, right? Uh, this is where we discover Lockhart's secret, mm-hmm. that he is a fraud. Bum, bum, bum. Yes. And he was trying to escape. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, when the teachers were like, now's your chance, Lockhart. I love that part. I do, too. Because they're, like, <laughs> they're clearly, like, just messing with him. They're just like, fucking Even with in this him. time of crisis, they have time to fuck with Lockhart. Because <laughs> it brings them joy, Ian. It does. They just, like, they need, like, to vent a little bit in this, you know, very difficult time. Yeah. So they might as well fuck with Lockhart a bit. Yeah. Uh, and so Harry and Ron discover him trying to leave, so they kidnap him. Yes. And take him to... The Chamber of Secrets, which is in the girls' bathroom. Yes. Which and is great. Salazar Slytherin clearly was masterminding that whole plot to put it in a girls' bathroom. I don't know. What, <laughs> what's the... I don't know. Is he just like, I'm a boy, so they'll never suspect <laughs> the girls' bathroom. I don't know. And I mean, it kind of... It is like really ingenious kind of that like such a weird random yeah kind of you know it's not like the great hall it's not like even yeah. a hallway it's like the girls one bathroom mm-hmm. that has a like a shitty faucet you know yeah um was kind of genius and especially in the movie the set design yeah. of the circular sinks is super and cool. it like coming open yeah i mm-hmm. loved that they uh, go down a slimy pipe Mm-hmm. and end up in this tunnel area and they're moving through it when Lockhart tries to disarm Ron, grabs his wand and memory charm them only for Ron's wand to strike again and <laughs> backfire the spell onto Lockhart. Um, Completely wiping Lockhart's memories. And this is just such a funny. Yeah. I don't know. There's so many great setups and payoffs in these books and in the movies like Ron's wand being broken all year and yeah. it backfiring him on him and then that being the wand that Lockhart takes like mm-hmm. there's just so many funny great payoffs setups and payoffs yeah things that just seem like an ongoing joke but then actually like factor into the plot definitely really well done um but Harry gets blocked off from them and has to trek on alone mm-hmm. when he gets to the the actual door to <laughs> the chamber of snakes the door the- of snakes <laughs> Behind another door of snakes. Behind another door of snakes. Where there's more. <laughs> um, for something called the Chamber of Secrets, there's not a lot in there. No. Surprise, the secret is snakes. <laughs> yeah. I would expect there to be like other things in there, like maybe treasure. It's almost like the. Or ro- dark art books or something. It's almost like the Room of Re- Requirements. Yeah. From the fifth book. That seems like more of like what you'd find in the Chamber of Secrets, yeah. just like an endless supply of like interesting stuff. Yeah, not Salazar Slytherin's man cave. Yeah, which he's just decked out with snake it's statues. It's just like a sewer with snake statues, and <laughs> you, then one real snake. He's just like more snakes. <laughs> I want more snakes. <laughs> Put a line of them yes. down the hallway. More snakes, and then a big statue of me. But surprise, a snake comes out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> This is where we meet Tom Riddle, who has come out of the diary in a physical form. Ginny is almost dead on the ground. And we get the reveal that Tom Riddle is actually Voldemort. Yeah, because he writes his name in the air and then rearranges the letters to spell out his entire name. How how long do you think he worked on that anagram? (laughs) (laughs) So I was trying in my head to think of, like, what would be, like, an earlier yeah. version of this name that, like, wasn't quite as good? Because, I mean, it's funny how you have to say, I am yeah. Lord Voldemort for it to Not be, like, a Lord true Voldemort. anagram. Yeah. And I pictured him, like, in school telling his, like, other friends. He's like, hey, guys, listen, I came up with this really cool name uh, where I'm going to be called Lord Voldemort. <laughs> Except for it to be an anagram, you have to say, it's a me, Lord Voldemort. <laughs> No, not working. I should be okay. I'll, I'll, I'll rearrange. I'll keep it. workshopping it. I love it. Which, by the way, I worked really hard I, to try to make that an actual anagram, and it is, except for the letter S. Nice. The S isn't in. So it a me. It a me, <laughs> Lord Valmord, uh, is the actual anagram. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's a me. You have to say it with an Italian accent. But it a me. It a me. <laughs> but it is really like silly when you actually think about it it is like that's how he came up with his name it is very silly (laughs) it seems like something a teenager would do when you're a kid and you read that shit you're like what i know um but then later you're like all right this is some emo kid (laughs) i know (laughs) 
he lets loose the snake though. And this becomes another one of these movie action scenes that really like expands on what's in the book. Um, because the book scene is very short. It is. And I do want to say, I don't know if I am more um, forgiving of the movie because I've seen it so many times that like it's not surprising or I'm, but like when reading it in the book, it's like, oh, OK, Tom Riddle. And now there, here's the basilisk. Now Fox the Phoenix flies in. He drops the hat. Yeah. It's the hat. What's the hat for? The hat has a sword in it. <laughs> what is the sword? I don't know. But Terry's going to stab the snake with it. <laughs> yeah. But now here's like a lot of stuff. It's very quick. Is thrown at you very fast in this finale. Yeah. Uh, but Harry does stab a snake through the head. <laughs> Uh, which is pretty fucking cool. Yeah. And it's very swashbuckling, which is fun, especially in the movie. Oh, yeah. Like when he's on top of the statue and just like slashing at the snake. Mm-hmm. And and the scene where he's in the pipes and the snake is blinded by Fox already. And it's like listening for him and he has to throw the rock. Yeah. I felt like the close-ups of the snake reminded me a lot of Jurassic Park. Yeah. In terms of like the teeth and like the snout, like snake Like animation. the velociraptor scene. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It was like very reminiscent of that. And yeah. also the special effects on the snake. Oh, they were great. Top notch. Like, and how they went back and forth between like an animatronic snake head and like yeah. the CGI snake. Like it all looked really well done. It did. So this really becomes an action set piece that goes on for a while. It's very suspenseful. It's exciting. Whereas in the book, it's just kind of like, and then the snake, and then the snake is blinded, and then he has the sword, and then he kills it. I also want to say, we've never talked about the music in the movie, but like, I don't know why I specifically remember this music when he enters the chamber and runs up to Ginny because mm-hmm. it's like this da 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 like it's just this like building music that's so well done. So like John yeah. Williams' score, like it gets keeps getting like tweaked as the movies go to be more bleak. Yeah, they're like okay now it's all minor chords and now it's played on a broken piano and now <laughs> it's just like <laughs> yeah. Um, but like the the foundation of it is so good. Definitely. Can I also say that I didn't think about this much until I read the book, but my God, Fox the Phoenix does fucking everything oh, yeah. in this finale. I mean, Harry kills the snake, though. True, but Fox the Phoenix, first of all, flies in and gives Harry the sword. Yeah. And then pecks out the eyes of the basilisk. Yes. And then after Harry is stabbed with the fang... Uh, cries on him and yeah. cures him. Yeah. And then in the book, there's even another moment where Fox grabs the diary and brings and it to brings him <laughs> so he can stab it. Jesus Christ. Okay, here's the diary. There's the fang. Yeah, this is what you need to do. <laughs> okay. And then he has to fly them all out of That's the... That's true. Like, Fox, like, literally almost does everything. He does. Like, not to diminish... What Harry does. Because he's like 12 and he stabs a snake through the mouth. Yeah, no. <laughs> he, he still does a lot. A and huge ass snake. He does. And he still, you know, it's still really cool and I still enjoy it. But in the book, that extra moment where Fox brings him the diary. I know. Like, boy, this this bird really kind of does everything, doesn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, But yeah, so he kills the snake. He stabs the diary. Saves Tom, Ginny. Tom Riddle is gone. Ginny. Uh... You do feel so bad for Jenny. I know. Though, because like... She has such a such a small role mm-hmm. in this story for her to be such an integral part of it. I don't know how I feel about that. I, I do feel like in the book you get, even though she's not active in it, in the story a lot, like you do really kind of get a sense of like her being this kind of girl who's like longing for Harry and you feel bad for her in that yeah. way. But she also, doesn't like have any lines really. No, it's she's more just kind of a plot device in this story. Yeah. And also, let's be honest, she just gets like catfished by Lord Voldemort. I know. <laughs> like via the diary. I know, and I feel so bad. I do too, because like in the book, he's like especially mean. He's like, oh, I had to listen to like this teenage girl blab about how much she likes you. Yeah. I'm like, stop. I know. <laughs> stop. No just... one asked you to be a diary. <laughs> stop slamming on her when she's like gonna die in a minute. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll be curious. Obviously, Ginny. Jenny's role in this books continues to be more prominent as it goes. Yeah. And I'll be curious, like, how that's handled. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do just feel, like, super bad for her in this story. I do, too. We get a bit of a wrap-up in Dumbledore's office where Harry finally tells everybody what happened. And 
Um, in the book, there's a lot of other people there. McGonagall, <laughs> the Weasleys are there because they're mm-hmm. worried about Ginny, um, etc. Also, Harry's just drenched in blood in the book. Oh my god. <laughs> Also, in the movie, he just straight up is holding the Gryffindor sword, the bloody Gryffindor sword, by, like, the blade. He's going to get some weird magical snake disease. I'm like, isn't this supposed to be, like, an extra sharp sword? Like, he's just like, yeah, I'm going to hold it by the blade. It's like, Harry, you just killed an enormous monster with that. Don't you even know how to hold it, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, But this is where Harry talks to Dumbledore, and he's like, hey, I'm really worried because, like, I'm super like Voldemort in a yeah, lot of ways. Yeah. And and I think Dumbledore does a lot to be like, no, you chose Gryffindor. That's why you're in Gryffindor. Mm-hmm. We kind of get little hints about future things that like Voldemort's powers or some of them went into Harry. Yeah. Um, I think it all does this really well where you're not left feeling like you don't have enough info. Yeah. But it does lay the groundwork. Yeah, yeah. For a lot of future stuff. Yeah. So I think it's all really done well. Mm-hmm. We get Malfoy coming in. Oh, yes. With Dobby and the uh, huge implication that Malfoy was the one that planted the diary in Ginny's um, possession and uh, that he wanted to do this to possibly like bring down the Weasley family specifically. Well, yeah, that was interesting. Like an interesting addition in yeah. the book to hear that. I'm like, oh, oh, huh. Which, by the way, the movie, I love it. They do such a great job of showing you that he does put the book yeah. in Jenny's cauldron because mm-hmm. we see the shot of him taking one book out, looking at it, and when he's putting two in. And it's just like, so obvious yet so subtle like when you're not looking for it like it's not apparent at all but i really appreciate them laying that like showing you putting it right in front of your face so when you go back you're like no shit definitely we get the a big feast because everyone has been unpetrified yeah and dumbledore calls off all final exams (laughs) and is this where we get into our recurring segment we've established dumbledore's dick moves yes because, I mean, they're in a school and Dumbledore's just like, no exams. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, there were students that were like not present for like the entire term because they were petrified. That's fair. But to drag, is this like there's no child left behind? Like, we're going to drag everyone else back. <laughs> yeah, it is weird. Because <laughs> there's this whole speech in the book that McGonagall gives because everyone's like, we still have final exams coming up. And yeah. she's like. Dumbledore specifically wanted the school to be run as if you were still here. Like, you guys are here for an education. Like, yeah. we're going to stay open. She gives this whole explanation as to why it's important to still take the exams. And then Dumbledore comes back. He's like, exams are canceled. School's out, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, McGonagall's a real prude, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, and just this continuing idea that, like, Dumbledore is, like, secretly still in control of everything. Well, and two, he, like, implies that, like, Fox wouldn't have come to, like, help Harry if Harry hadn't have, like, said nice things about Dumbledore <laughs> in the Chamber of Secrets first. Yeah, And he you're does. like, would he have come to help him if he hadn't said that Dumbledore was the greatest wizard of all time? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm wondering. No, abs- yeah, it, it's really funny that that was, like, the criteria yeah. that saved Harry's life. Oh, and Dobby is freed, of course. Yes. Uh, I thought this was really well played out in the uh, movie, How Harry Hid the Sock in the Book. Yeah, in the book, he hides the book in the sock? Oh, no, doesn't he just throw the sock at Malfoy? Yeah. No, he, like, puts the book in his, like, stuffs it in his sock. Oh, does he? Yeah, and then, like, hands it all to him, and he's like, ugh, get oh, this I, away from me. Oh, I, like, me. misread that. I thought he just, like, I thought he just took his sweaty sock and threw it, <laughs> threw at, it Malfoy. at Malfoy. Threw it at Malfoy. He's like, here's, go- <laughs> here's nothing, and then, like, by the off chance, like, Dobby catches it. Yeah. Like, a bouquet at a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Dobby's free, and this is, like... Such a really touching moment. It is. Because Dobby uh, has gets clearly to, been miserable for a yeah, long time. Yeah, and gets to just, and has no problem immediately turning on oh, yeah. uh, Lucius yeah. and like knocking him back on his ass, which is great. It is. In the book, he throws him down a whole flight of steps. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the feast and everything. Mm-hmm. And the movie has these great moments where Hermione runs back in. Oh, yeah. And because she is petrified and they're so happy to see her. And then Hagrid comes in because mm-hmm. he's back from Azkaban and everyone cheers for him. I know. I'm like, yes, 
I love this. I do too. Like Hagrid's so great. Do you think it's weird? Like, I feel like Hagrid was very prominent in the first book. Yeah. And he's still around in the second. He's less prominent though, I agree. He's less prominent though until he becomes like an integral part of the plot. Yeah. And then he's like, whoa, it's Hagrid. And then when he comes back at the end, like, yeah, it's great that he's back. But it feels weird Mm -hmm. in a way because, like, he was only significant when he was, like... Suspected. Suspected of being a killer. Yeah. (laughs) And everyone's like, yeah, you're not a killer. (laughs) Yeah, it is weird. (laughs) It's a little odd. Uh, But then that basically closes us out. Yeah. That's it. It is it. And now it's time for the age-old question that I have not thought about (laughs) at all. But So I will hand off to you, Adina... What do you like better, the book or the movie? You know, I actually am kind of torn. Yeah, I agree. I'm really torn because uh, we talked about in the last episode how the first movie is good, but it kind of drags. Mm-hmm. Even though the second movie is just as long. Actually, I haven't double checked this, but I read that this is the longest movie in really? the entire series. It doesn't seem long at all. It doesn't. It like, has. It goes by so fast. It has a really good pace. Yeah. And especially like the build up to the climax of this one. Yeah. Like you feel really carried into it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. This one's executed really, really well. Like out of the first two, this one I think is better than the first movie probably. Yeah. And I don't know what it was when I was reading the book, but I felt like less interested in it. Mm-hmm. I wasn't as excited to read it. Yeah. And, and maybe that's like. I mean, when it's a a mystery plot and you know the solution, Mm -hmm. does that detract from reading it? Well, and I was really like, every time I read the first one, I'm always like, oh, it's so magical. And then I have favorites later on, but I feel like there's always a lot that I'm excited about when I'm reading it. For this one, I didn't really feel that at all. Well, I think, honestly, a big part of that is it is... The mystery is almost everything in this story. Yeah. Like, you do find out a little bit more about, like, the prejudice in this world. There is some world building like that. But Harry doesn't really go through any kind of an arc. That's true. Um, There's kind of, like, no, like, in the next story, like, it's much more hinged around Harry's, like, past and, like, other figures in his life. So you do have that emotional drive. Mm -hmm. This is more just him being, like, Detective Harry. Yeah. And, like... There's a lot of mystery elements. There's and, gags and funny bits. Oh, but yeah. yeah. But like a lot of red herrings and stuff. And like, I don't know. It all, even though I think it's a really well told mystery. Definitely. It's still primarily almost exclusively that. Yeah. So I think it, when you do know what's going on, it is a little bit like. Less exciting. Yeah. Or less engaging, perhaps. I think I'm going to say the movie. I kind of agree actually which is crazy i didn't think i would do this with the harry potter books (laughs) i mean i thought i might but i don't know i think when i look back on the books that i'd read the second one is like the least memorable for me Mm -hmm. there's probably one that i dislike more and i'll leave that up to you to determine which one you think that's gonna be but i think this one is the least memorable and most easily forgettable for me and i really did love watching the movie it was very enjoyable. So I'm going to have to say movie. Yeah, I mean, in this movie, the humor is so spot on. Um, there's just, I don't know, the action's really well done. The sets are great. Like I said, the physicality of everything, the performance is top notch. Um, you know, like we said, these early, these first two movies specifically kind of get forgotten, I think, sometimes. Yeah. But in terms of just like well-rounded, you know, family, quote unquote, movies, Um, that have a lot of action and excitement and, you know, gags and stuff like they're just really paced perfectly. The tone is right. This one, even more than the first one, I think. Oh yeah. And and the performances like Harry got better Mm -hmm. and Hermione, like everyone kind of like, you know, stepped it up a little bit in terms of performing. They stepped it up. They really just like, you know, cruised (laughs) through that first one. It was like 11 year old actors. (laughs) No, they got like they got a lot better. Yeah. Um yeah, I I I think we've we've talked myself into saying the movie as well. <laughs> All right, it's got to be a movie then. It's a movie. Don't come don't come for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's do a lightning round. Lightning. So, first thing, uh Moaning Myrtle. Yes. I told you that so the, this was me just repeating what I kind of knew. 
that she was really old, actually, when she played this role. Uh And I was like, I think she was like probably like 30. Oh, my God. She was 37 (gasps) playing Moaning Myrtle. In pigtails and glasses. In pigtails and glasses. Oh, my God. Why? Why couldn't they find a child actor? I have no clue. And plus, she returns later in in the fourth one. To be even older. To be even older. (laughs) Isn't that nuts? Yeah, I don't understand why they would do I don't, that. But also, it's weird how you don't notice at all. No. Like, not even a little. Mm-mm. Maybe it's the ghostness. Maybe. Maybe that you just, don't get, like, like, a good look at her face. Yeah, I, I'm going to attribute it to that, but I don't know. But that's bananas. <laughs> that is bananas. Okay, so I want to talk about the mandrakes for a little bit, because we're led to believe in the book that they are fully sentient, <laughs> yeah. So they're born, they're like babies yeah. in the beginning. And then later they talk about them getting older and like ac- getting acne and then also throwing parties <laughs> in the garden shed. And then like they're going to start like they're being all secretive and they might move into each other's pots, which like implies that they might have like romantic relationships. And I'm just like, and they're just talking about murdering them like so callously. I'm like, they seem like they're real, like, humans having feelings. I know. And I'm like, why? Hashtag save the mandrakes. And then I also wanted to mention the mandrakes again. In the movie, there's that great scene where they're in herbology class, and they're pulling up the mandrakes with their earmuffs on, and we get a great part where Neville passes out, and oh, yeah. Professor Sprout is like, oh, just leave him there. <laughs> And then a part where Draco puts his finger in the mandrake's mouth and it like bites down on it. So funny. It's funny because uh, they have every single class with Slytherin. Yeah. And I think it's solely so that they can have more Draco in like, because we got so many good reaction shots from him yeah. in different classes <laughs> that I think they're just like, we need Draco like in every classroom scene. And I agree. That we can have him in. Uh, I wanted to talk about how um, Hogwarts does a terrible job of scrubbing terrible figures from its past out of its oh my god um, yes. history. <laughs> so first, most obvious one that's like in the movie too is that one of the four founders of Hogwarts, Salazar Slytherin, was like a uh, wizard racist. Yeah. In terms of like, I only think pure bloods um, should be allowed to be taught at this school, and everyone's like, mm, dude, stop talking. And he's like, nope. Uh, and he just like held on to those beliefs. And it's, like, still well-known. And they still have a house named for him. Yeah. And, like, kids are put in that house. And they're like, hey, you're in Guess the... Guess what? You're a racist You're now. in the racist house. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, shouldn't there be a petition to, like, change, change this? The name. Like, I couldn't help but, like, connect it to, like, uh, Confederate um, general statues yeah. here in the U.S. that were like, can you take that down? Because they were, like, a racist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and also, in another part, uh, they know that there's a trophy in the trophy case for Tom Riddle. Yeah. You know, Voldemort, like (laughs) wizard Hitler. They still have (laughs) his trophy on display. They're like, yeah, he did this really great thing for the school once. And so like, we want to make sure we polish this trophy and make it look really nice. Of wizard Hitler. Of wizard Hitler. (laughs) And Dumbledore gives a line in the book like, oh, not a lot of people know that Voldemort went to this school and wasn't, named Tom Riddle and I'm like can we like up our history game here yeah because like not telling people this shit is like really problematic that you're like super fucked up yeah that you're like yeah no we should you know make sure we teach kids good values here so that we don't teach another wizard Hitler exactly (laughs) so just like I don't know it was also crazy (laughs) last for lightning round I just want to briefly mention in the book uh, Fred and George, when they break Harry out of the Dursley's house, they have to pick the lock where oh, Harry's belongings yeah. are being kept. And they're not allowed to use magic because school hasn't started yet. And Fred and George specifically say, yeah, not a lot of people like care to learn about picking lot- locks because it's a muggle skill and they like have magic. But we think it's like a really valuable skill to know. And I'm like, you know what? I love that. I for do them. too. <laughs> yes. It's so smart that like they would be cunning in every possible they're way. They're like in any chance, like we don't have magic, we'll be able to get ourselves out of a situation. Mm-hmm. I love it so much. <laughs> And that's our lightning round. Thank you so much for listening to uh, our follow-up Harry Potter episode on the Chamber of Secrets. We really love doing these ones. It's really fun. We'll definitely continue to do them. Yeah. Uh, If you have any Harry Potter thoughts, opinions, uh, answers to our questions, 
You can email us at cover to credit pod at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Find us on Instagram. Uh, on Twitter, we are at cover to credits. And uh, just let us know your thoughts on Harry Potter or any episodes you want to do, you think we should do in the future on any other adaptations that mm-hmm. you enjoy. And if you'd like to support us, you can find us on Patreon. We do have a lot of really great people over there that are supporting us um, by um, contributing and being our patrons. And it's really helpful. We do have some costs associated with doing the podcast, so it does help to offset that for us. And patrons do get um, bonus episodes. We just did a bonus episode on uh, The Great Gatsby. Um, And they get um, content uh, episode schedules ahead of time. And they also get first priority on um episodes that they would like to see us do so yeah so if you like the podcast and want to engage with us more we're very um attentive to patreon and answering messages or anything like that so you know reach out to us on there and thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time see you next time bye Bye.